guys, Miss Miklos here, and today we're going to be relearning something you guys learned in Algebra 2, but this was definitely one of the toughest concepts, so that's why we're spending a whole day talking about it. So we're talking about something called the fundamental theorem of algebra, and fundamental makes it seem super, super important, which it actually is. And we're going to start off by solving for the zeros. Now, once again, our vocab... We know zeros are the x-intercepts, the roots, and um, zeros covers a little bit more because zeros infers that they are both real and imaginary, where if we just see x-intercepts, we know that those are only the real zeros. So first, let's go ahead and just review the four different ways that we know how to solve quadratic equations. The first two are super simple. That's when we would square root both sides or when we would factor. Um, if possible, I think those are the two easiest methods to use. If those methods don't work, then we can always use the quadratic formula or completing the square. And we've spent a bunch of time reviewing those already in this chapter. So let's go ahead and get started on number one. Um, we know that this zero means that y equals zero. That's what we're finding here. That's why we set it equal to zero. And I always see if we can factor something first. So here I just have a quadratic equation. I know factors of negative 56 that add up to be negative one would be negative eight and seven. So I'm gonna set both of those factors equal to zero. And I get x equals eight and x equals negative seven. Okay, and I can just leave it like that. Now, just to kind of clarify answers, if they specifically ask us um, to find the x-intercepts, that's when I should write it as an ordered pair. Okay, number two. Sad news, guys. There's no factors of two that add up to be negative two. So I'm going to use my favorite method, which is CTS. If you wanted to use quadratic formula on your own, that's totally fine. So I'm beginning by adding negative 2 to both sides. And then I'm going to take that middle coefficient, divide it by 2, and square it, which is plus 1. So I'm adding 1 to both sides. So when I factor this, I get x minus 1 squared equals negative 1. I need to square root both sides, and I need to remember my plus or minus. So I get x minus 1 equals plus or minus this should look familiar to us. We know that that's equal to i. So I get x equals 1 plus or minus i. Now, if you guys use quadratic formula, we get the same exact answer. And number three, this is a good example of the one that I would use the square rooting method. So I'm moving that 16 over to the other side. And then I'm going to square root both sides. And I get x equals plus or minus 4i. Now, if we look at all three of these, okay, we notice all of them, we had two answers, and that makes sense because on all of them, we had a degree of two. And we have learned that the degree matches the number of zeros we will find. So the things we're going to need to find today, and this should look familiar. We did this earlier this chapter. We need to find all the zeros the x-intercepts. Remember, if we have a double zero, we need to write it multiple times. The y-intercept, which is the constant, the end behavior, and we want to graph it. Now, for higher order polynomials, the very first thing we're going to do is check to see if it's factorable, um, like we've done in previous lessons. If it is not factorable, then we can solve using synthetic division. And the way that we choose our box number, since I'm not um, dividing by anything in this case, is by doing the factors of the constant divided by the, the factors of the leading coefficient. And we call these possible rational zeros. And the reason why we need to, to know possible rational zeros um, is because what that means, these are all the numbers um, that could possibly work, and rational we've learned is anything that is can be written as a fraction of integers. So any zero that would possibly be a fraction or a whole number will be one of these options. We know something is a zero if it has a remainder of zero, and then we're gonna use synthetic division until it is quadratic and solve it. So 
let's go ahead and check out number one. Now, um, our goal is to graph the following polynomials by hand and check with the graphing calculator. Just a reminder, on this test, there's two portions, one with the graphing calculator and one without. If you guys ever can use your graphing calculator, um, I would use it to save some time. Okay, so on your homework, we're using the graphing calculator to possibly narrow down our options. Okay, that's not going to give me all of my answers. Um, you're not going to get full credit on your um, homework if you don't follow this particular method or factoring, but it could just save us a little bit of time. So, number one. Whoa, that went a little crazy. Okay, number one here, I have f of x equals x cubed minus x squared minus x minus 15. So the first thing I'm going to do here, um, I don't think I can factor that. So I'm going to go ahead and set up synthetic division just like we did last or two classes ago. Our possible rational zeros or PRZs as I'm going to put them for short would be all the factors of 15. So that would be 1, 15, 3, 5, and all of those are plus or minus, divided by the factors of 1. Okay, so I'm taking the factors of 15 and the factors of this 1 and writing them down. When we divide those out, my options are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 15, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 5. So altogether, we have eight options. Now, I know a maximum of three of these is going to work because it's x cubed. So, let's just kind of demonstrate what this looks like. Normally, I begin by starting with ones and negative ones because it makes it pretty easy. So, I'm going to bring down my one. One times one is one, I get zero. Zero times one is zero, I get negative one, negative one. I get negative 16. Notice this number is not zero, so that means... I need to start over. 1 is not a 0. So I'm going to write these out again. And my caution to you guys, um, I think it's really easy to make little mistakes when we're going through this because um, our math itself is pretty easy, so sometimes we rush through it. So that is my caution to you. I'm going to jump ahead and try 3, maybe because I know what works. But keep in mind, if I kept trying things, then um, I would know that they didn't work if I wasn't getting zero at the end. So I'm bringing down the one. One times three is three, I get two. Two times three is six, I get five. Five times three is 15, and we are so happy there. And we know from our previous knowledge that every time we use synthetic division, it goes down one degree. So our original problem was x cubed, so this becomes x squared plus 2x plus 5 equals 0. And for fun this time, um, after I notice, oh, I can't factor because no factors of 5 add up to be 2, I'm going to go ahead and use quadratic formula because I know some of you guys prefer that method. So I'm going to do the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Okay, so I'm just substituting those values in. And I get negative 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 16 over 2. So I have negative 2 plus or minus 4i, and I need to divide both of those by 2. So I get negative 1 plus or minus 2i. Now, I have imaginary answers. Those are not x-intercepts, but they are zeros. So my zeros are going to be, and let me kind of zoom in here. We found x equals 3 and x equals one, negative 1 plus or minus 2i. It makes sense I have three answers because our degree is 3. Our x-intercepts, we only have one of them. It is 3, 0 because 3 is the only real number. We don't care about graphing imaginary answers. Our y-intercept is always the constant, 
So I'm going to write 0, negative 15 as our constant. Now left and right hand behavior. I taught you guys last time that one method we could use is by looking at this leading term and going, oh, it's odd and it's positive. So to the left, it is going to negative infinity or down. And to the right, it's going up, which is positive infinity. The other method that we could use, okay, if I look, and I'm going to kind of zoom here, so sorry. I'm going to move over here. And I know that my only zero here is at three. So I'm going to go ahead and plot that. And I'm also going to plot zero, negative 15, because we know that point. Basically, let me get something fun here. Anything, woo, on this side of three is a number that we could substitute in. And the reason being, if I know that three is the only answer here, that means that, um, and by answer I mean zero, that's the only zero, that means that in this direction it's never gonna cross the x-axis again. So if I know that anything past three is positive, that means it's going to positive infinity. If I know that it's negative, then I know it's going to negative infinity. Likewise, I can choose a number to the right of three and it will tell me positive infinity or negative infinity. So I just want to think for a moment, what if I put in negative 10? Okay, if I put negative, oh, I forgot I had that one on. Here we go. Let's go to a more basic laser pointer. I love the laser pointers. Okay, if I use this one, if I put negative 10 in, I would get a negative number. So that would make sense to the left, it's going down. If I put in something like positive 10, that tells me 10 cubed, that's a positive number, so it would be going up to the right. So that's just an alternate method that you could possibly use. I really uh, don't care which method you use, it just matters how we do it. Okay, so when we are graphing this, sorry my phone's going off because the angels just scored, so that's exciting. Um, we don't know some of the details. We don't know where mins and maxes are, and guess what? We don't care. So all I know is it's going down to the left and up to the right, and it needs to cross at negative 15 and at 3. And I don't know what's going on over here. And it's okay. So if you guys graphed it a little bit differently, like if you went like this and then put some like little squiggle in and went up, that's fine. I don't care. Okay, what I would be grading for is everything we wrote down. Is it in the right direction? Is it crossing through the correct points? The final thing I want to do is actually to write out the factors just so we can kind of see this. In your homework tonight, it's going to ask you to do this. So our factors would be x minus 3, x minus negative 1 plus 2i, and x minus negative 1 minus 2i. Okay, and that's building on something we've learned in a previous lesson. Um, and remember, it's always x minus whatever our 0 is. Number 2 looks like a lot of fun because we're going to have five zeros. Woo! Now, I don't think we can factor that, so let's figure out what our possible rational zeros are. Once again, the way we find these, it's the factors of our constant divided by the factors of our leading coefficient. So I have 1 and 8 and 2 and 4 over 1. When I divide those out, I get 1, 8, 2, 4. And you guys might think that it is dumb um, for us to go ahead and write it in this way, but actually um, what it does um, sometimes we have a leading coefficient other than one, so it makes it a lot easier for us to go ahead and write them out separately so I can really see what the options are. So let's set this up. Whoa. And um, as I'm setting this up, what I want you guys to do right now is graph this in your graphing calculator. Okay, and the reason why I want you to do that is I want you to kind of see what would give me um, a thought into using a specific number? 
When I'm setting up synthetic division, I notice I'm missing an x to the fourth power, so I'm going to go 1, 0, 1, 2, negative 12, 8. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try 1 first. 1 normally is my favorite. I like simple math. So I'm bringing down my 1. 1 times 1 is 1, I get 1. 1 times 1 is 1, I get 2. 2 times 1 is 2, I get 4. 4 times 1 is 4, I get negative 8. Negative 8 times 1 is negative 8. So I get 0, and we have a winner here. Now at this point, this new polynomial is to the fourth degree. I don't know how to go ahead and solve that, so I'm going to keep going. In fact, I'm just going to throw this out here. Why don't we try negative 2? And if you check your graph, you might see why I chose those two numbers. Okay, 1 times negative 2 is negative 2, so I get negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 2 is 2, so I get 4. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8, so I get negative 4. Negative 4 times negative 2 is 8, and we have another winner. Woo! At this point, some things I want to point out. First of all, we have a smaller constant. What this is going to do for us, it actually is going to eliminate some of our zeros that we would possibly use. And what I mean by that is 8 is no longer a factor of this constant. So there's no way that I would put 8 into the box number. Okay, in fact, um, if you guys look at your graph, you're going to notice that something really strange happens at 1. In fact, it looks like it bounces off of the x-axis. What this bounce tells us is that we have a double zero. Now, if I was doing this without my graphing calculator on the test, quite honestly, I would probably try negative one, two, four, negative four, and I realized that none of them work. If I try negative two again, it's not going to work. But let's try one again. Okay, and, and let's just kind of remind ourselves, if a number works twice, that means that it is a double zero and a bounce occurs. Just because something works once does not mean it's going to work again. Also, I just want to remind us that the order that I choose to put these in does not matter. I end up getting the same answer either way. And let me just write out some nice notes to us. That was to the fifth power. That was to the fourth power. This is to the third power. Okay, so that's why I want to keep going here. So, 1 times 1 is 1, I get 0. 0 times 1 is 0, I get 4. 4 times 1 is 4, and I get 0. And now, all of a sudden, I have something that has a degree of 2, and we know how to solve this, so I'm going to make this x squared plus 4 equals 0. So x squared equals negative 4. So x is equal to plus or minus 2i. So if I look, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different answers. And just for fun, I want to show us that technically this time, if I stopped at a degree of 3, I actually could have factored this. Okay, If I had x cubed minus x squared plus 4x minus 4 equals 0, Back in Algebra 2, we learned a method called factoring by grouping. And this does not always work. What signified to me that this would work, we always did this when we had four terms, and I noticed that these two terms had a GCF, where if I took it out, these numbers would look the same as the first two numbers. So, in x cubed minus x squared, I have an x squared that I can take out, and I'm left with x minus 1. And 4x minus 4, I have a 4 I can take out, and I am left with x minus 1. Now, I notice both of these have an x minus 1. So I can take that out, and I am left with x squared plus 4. Guess what? If we solve these, I'm going to get this answer, and I'm going to get the answer we got. I'm kind of running out of room here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry, I'm out of control with my movements today. And I got that answer. So I just want to point out there's multiple ways to get to the right answers. Okay. 
I think my issue is I forget that I don't have to use two fingers to scroll like you do in almost every, in, like in notability. So for zeros, I'm going to write x equals negative 2, x equals 1, x equals 1, mm -hmm. x equals plus or minus 2i. So my zeros are negative 2, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. My y-intercept is our constant, so that is 8. So I'm going to write 0, 8. And I'm going to go ahead and just plot these points right away here. Okay, so 0, 8 is up here. I have negative 2, 0, and 1, 0. And so if I'm finding left bound behavior, I can choose any number to the left of negative 2. Right bound behavior, any point to the right of 1. So I'm going to try negative 10. I like tens because it's easy to take it to a power. But quite honestly, the value doesn't matter. It's just if it's negative or positive. So negative 10 to the fifth power would be a negative value. So it's going down or negative infinity. If I put positive 10 in, it's going up, which is positive infinity. Now, if you wanted to memorize what we talked about last time, that's awesome. Use that. So Another thing we'll notice is like graphing these kind of makes common sense with the direction because I don't foresee myself being able to plot these three points and not have it go down, okay? Because it needs to somehow connect from here to here and the only way I foresee that happening is going down here. So let's go ahead and at one. Okay, we said there was something special about 1. In fact, we said that that was a double zero. So, what's going to happen here? It's going to bounce off of the x-axis. Okay, and the only time that happens is when we have a double zero. So, let's go ahead and write these as factors. Okay, just kind of to practice that concept. Our factors would be x minus 1, x minus 1, x plus 2, x minus 2i, and x plus 2i. Now that would be kind of a pain to multiply out, but it's helpful for us to see that that's how this concept connects to what we've done previously. Okay, number three. Possible rational zeros. I'm going to go a little quicker this time because I feel like this video is getting long. Okay, I have 1 and 12, I have 2 and 6, I have 3, and I have 4. Over. This time I have a leading coefficient of 2, so I need to think of it as divided by 1 divided by 2. So I have 1, 12, 2, 6, 3, and 4. Okay, that's everything divided by this number. Now I need to take all these and divide by 2. So I have 1 half. 12 divided by 2 is 6. I already have 6 written down, so I don't need to redo that. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 3 divided by 2 I don't have, so I'm going to write that down. And then 4 divided by 2 is also 2, which is written down. So this time I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 different options for possible rational zeros, and we know that only four of them are going to go ahead and work. So let's go ahead and try this out. So I'm going to say 2, 5, negative 11, negative 20, and 12. And I'm going to go ahead and start with 2. So 2 times 2 is 4, and I get 9. 9 times 2 is 18, and I get 7. 7 times 2 is 14, I get negative 6, negative 12, and we have a winner, which makes us happy. Now, I want you guys to know I'm choosing this number because I know what's going to work. It, in actuality, if I don't have the capability of using my graphing calculator, um, it really is a guess and check type thing. There isn't a mathematical reason why I would choose something over something else, okay? Next, 
I am not, not down to x squared yet. And the reason why when we have x squared we stop is because we know quadratic um, methods. So that makes it easier. Okay, this is x cubed. Um, and I notice now my, my new um, constant is negative 6. So that actually cancels out a few things. It cancels out 12. Um, it cancels out 4. I don't have to worry about those options anymore because those are not factors of 6. And so um, let's try negative 2. Negative 2 is a factor of 6. So I'm going to bring 2 down. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4, so I have 5. Negative 10, so negative 3. 6, so I get 0. So, so far we are seeing 2 and negative 2 work. Now that this is quadratic, I'm setting up this equation and setting it equal to 0. And I'm going to see if we can factor this. I know 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. And I can think of factors of negative 6 that add up to be 5. So I'm going to say 2x and x. And I'm going to try negative 1 and positive 3. And if I check my inside and outside, I get 6 minus 1, which is 5. So I'm going to set both of these equal to 0. So I get 2x equals 1. So x is 1 half. I want us to note that that is one of our options that we could have substituted in right away. And x plus 3 equals 0. So I get x equals negative 3. So I know I'm in good shape because we found four different zeros here. I found x equals plus or minus 2, x equals negative 3, and x equals 1 half. My zeros, these are all zeros because they're all real numbers. My y-intercept this time is 12. Okay, left-hand and right-hand behavior, if I put in like, a negative 10, negative 10 to the fourth power is positive times a positive means it's going up or it's going to positive infinity. If I put in a number to the right like positive 10, 10 to the fourth is positive times 2 is positive, so it's going up, which is positive infinity. So let's have some fun graphing this. So our y-intercept is 12. I have zeros at 2, negative 2, negative 3, and 1 half. Now, this is one I definitely don't know where mins and maxes are, and that's okay. I know it's going up to the left, so I'm going to go ahead and go up. And then I'm going to go ahead and put arrows um, on both ends because these arrows tell me it's continuing. Now, if your minimum values were further down, that's fine. So this would be an example of what this graph would look like. Number four, the reason why I want to go through one like number four here is because I said earlier that the first thing we always want to do, if possible, is factor. And this is factorable. And the reason why I always want to factor first, if possible, is just because it saves me some time. It makes life a little bit easier. So I'm going to go ahead and set this equation equal to 0, because I know a 0 means that y is 0. And I know I can factor this using x squared and x squared. And I need to think what factors of 9 add up to be 10. And it would be plus 9 and plus 1. So I'm setting both of these equal to 0. So I get x squared equals negative 9 and x squared equals negative 1. So x is plus or minus 3i and x is plus or minus i. And you guys might be seeing this would have been awful to try and use synthetic division on because nothing would have worked. So that's why we need to know how to factor. So our zeros, we do have four zeros, plus or minus 3i, plus or minus i, that's what x, e, x is. We have no x-intercept, so I'm going to say none. Our y-intercept is 0, 9. Since this is x to the fourth, okay, remember it's even and positive, which tells us 
it's going up in both directions, or we could have used that substituting number in method. And quite honestly, I'm not quite sure what this looks like. What I do know is that it's going through at 9, and it's going up in both directions. So if you drew like a U shape, that'd be fine. If we drew like a W shape, as long as um, we know that this was kind of where it was crossing the axis, that'd be fine. So just kind of a quick recap. Oh my gosh, sorry. My cat is like stepping on my screen here. Apparently he likes math. Okay, recap. Methods to solve for zeros. If it's quadratic, factor, quadratic formula, square root, complete the square, graphing calculator. If higher degree, we know synthetic division, factoring, graphing calculator. So we've seen a bunch of different methods. It's important that you guys um, know how to use all these methods adequately um, because remember there are two parts of our test. Okay, we did this a little bit um, earlier in the chapter is finding polynomials with the given zeros, but we didn't work with anything that had imaginary numbers. So, um, we know f of x equals, we learned previously, remember a factor is always x minus the zero, so I'm going to have x minus 3, x minus i, ooh, that looks fun, and x minus negative i would be plus i. And remember, we call this our factored form. I'm going to write FF for factored form there. Um, and this might look really ugly, but what I want to stress to us is I always want to start by multiplying those together. And you guys may recognize that these are actually a conjugate pair. Crazy how math like keeps coming back and forth here. So if I FOIL, I get x squared plus ix minus ix minus i squared. And that looks awful until we remember that these ix's cancel out and I know negative i squared is equal to positive one. So the thing I want us to see here is when I multiply um, these together, all of our imaginary stuff will always cancel out. And a lot of times you guys are asking like, well, why do I need to know imaginary numbers? And um, mathematically, one of the reasons why we need them is because it would be impossible to write equations of these functions if we didn't have any of these available. Now, we're not done yet. I need to keep multiplying. So I'm going to get x cubed plus x minus 3x squared minus 3. So I'm going to write that as x cubed minus 3x squared plus x minus 3. This is what we call our simplified form, or SF there for shortcut. For short. For shortcut makes no sense. Okay. So, key thing, just like we did in our previous lecture this chapter, x minus the zero, only new thing we're adding in are imaginary numbers, and we talked about complex numbers earlier this week. On number two, we have a nice reminder that imaginary zeros always come in conjugate pairs. So, sometimes life will get a little bit tricky, and it'll give us something like, oh, we have zero, four, and here it's just giving me one answer. I know if 1 plus radical 3i is an answer, 1 minus radical 3i also has to be a 0. If I forget that, I'm not going to get the right answer, and life is going to be messy because I'm going to have i's and radicals and all sorts of stuff in my equation. So, factored form. I have x minus 0 times x minus 4 times x minus 1 plus radical 3i, yep, it's so long, I need to move over, times x minus 1 minus radical 3i. So, I have f of x equals, I'm going to simplify this a little bit further, x times x minus 4 times x minus 1 minus radical 3i, so I just distributed that negative, 
times x minus 1 plus radical 3i. And I also distributed that negative. So I'm going to group these two together and these two together and do some work at the same time here. So this first one, not that tough for me to deal with. I'm just distributing that x to both terms, so I get x squared minus 4x. Now our other stuff here looks like it's going to be super fun. Yes, that was sarcasm. x times x, x squared x times negative 1, negative x. x times radical 3i, sounds weird, but it's going to be radical 3i x. Negative 1 times x is negative x. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. Negative 1 times rad radical 3i, there we go, is negative radical 3i. Now we're moving on to our negative radical 3i. Negative radical 3i times x is negative radical 3i x. Negative radical 3i times negative 1 is positive radical 3i. Negative radical 3i times positive radical 3i is negative 3i squared. And this looks lots of fun to work with. Now. Good news, some stuff cancels out here. Our radical 3 ix's cancel out. Our radical 3 i's also cancel out. So I'm going to simplify this to be f of x equals x squared minus 4x times x squared, and I have negative x, negative x, so I have minus 2x, and then I have 1, and I have negative 3i squared, so I really have plus 4. So, here we go, final step. x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. x squared times negative 2x is negative 2x cubed. x squared times 4 is 4x squared. Negative 4x times x squared is negative 4x cubed. Negative 4x times negative 2x is 8x squared. Negative 4x times 4 is negative 16x. And now I'm going to add all my like terms together and write it in descending order. So I have x to the fourth minus 6x cubed plus 12x squared minus 16x. That was a lot of fun. I, I promised you fun. There it is. Mm -hmm. And it would make sense that this is x to the fourth mm -hmm. because we do have four answers. Okay, so... Um, even though this was a ton of work to get to here, notice all this work is stuff we've previously learned how to do. And our final concept of the day, using given zeros, sorry, my phone keeps going off. Apparently, I'm real popular tonight. Um, using given zeros to find the remaining zeros of the polynomial. So it's telling us to find all the zeros of the polynomial, and it gives us something now. The nice thing about giving us a zero is it gives us a head start. We don't have to worry about trying to figure out different numbers that are going to work. We know 3i is going to work. So I'm going to go ahead and set up our synthetic division here. And I'm going to space it out a little bit more than normal because I have this i that we're putting in. And when I bring down 1, 1 times 3i is 3i. So now I have 1 plus 3i, so I get 1 plus 3i. So 3i times 1 plus 3i is actually distributing, okay? 3i times 1 is 3i. I'm writing that last because that is um, the imaginary part of the number. 3i times 3i is 9i squared, which is negative 9. When I add these together, I am just left with 3i. 3i times 3i is 9i squared, which is negative 9, and we get 0. Hooray! Now the problem, this is x squared, but see all these i's in here? That can cause us a little bit of stress. Unless we remember i's always come in pairs. So if we know that 3i is a 0, negative 3i also has to be a 0. 
So let's go through this process. 1 times negative 3i is negative 3i, so I get 1. 1 times negative 3i is negative 3i, so I get 0. So this was x cubed, this is x squared. This is just a linear function, so it's x plus 1 equals 0. And that's easy for me to solve that x equals negative 1. So our zeros here, x equals plus or minus 3i, and x equals negative 1. Those would be our answers. So definitely lots of info going on today. Um, if you're struggling on something, please, please, please come in and see me. I'm more than happy to assist.